Please, Klaus. Okay, so I'm, I will give the status report of the uh, ATLAS experiment. And uh, after some tour on detector status and data taking in 2012 and uh, physics object at high pileup, I will come to the physics highlights that we had in the time after the, large, uh, the la uh, last LHCC in March. Okay, so uh, we had a couple of detector improvements in the winter shutdown. First of all, we installed the so-called EE chambers of the muon system, 100% uh, on the... Uh, 100% on the C side and something like 50% on the A side. These are chambers that cover the, uh, the, uh, that cover the uh, transition region between the barrel and the end cup. And you see here now our efficiency for uh, muons to reconstruct them with at, least, uh, with at least two station. And here you see nothing. And this is actually the, uh, the new chambers on the, uh, on the C side. And here you also see that the hole is uh, still uh, is, is partly filled, so it's uh, here at something like 70%. These are the new chambers on the A side. Then we installed additional muon shielding, and you see here the, back, uh, the, uh, the background rate, and you see here in this, uh, this peak has basically gone, so this shielding has, uh, uh, is doing what it, uh, what it should do. And we installed 40 out of the uh, 256 new uh, low-voltage power supplies for the tile calorimeter to, eliminate, to uh, eliminate trips and to suppress noise. And these, uh, and these are the trips we see in the, uh, in the tile cal, and these are the old low-voltage power supplies where you see... Uh, where you see trips and exactly zero trips for the new ones, and the rest will be installed in the next uh, in the next shutdown. But uh, it is proven already that they uh, that they work. Okay, data taking in 2012. So uh, data taking is progressing uh, as efficiently as uh, last year with an efficiency around uh, 95%. And you see this is the, uh, this is the Atlas Luminosity. Uh, Steve has shown this plot already. So in green is uh, what the LHC has uh, delivered and in, uh, in yellow what Atlas has recorded. And we, have basically now, um, we are basically now matching the luminosity from last year. Uh, the non-working channels in the detectors are mostly in the few per mil region uh, up to uh, with a maximum at uh, 4% for the pixels. The most severe problem we have this year is a gas leak in the TRT. This leads to a loss of uh, 4 liter of gas per hour. The problem is it's xenon, so it uh, costs some money, but uh, there is no loss in, uh, in physics. The data quality is uh, larger than 90%, uh, so data quality means the uh, data that are actually usable for uh, physics analysis, and uh, most of it here is in the liquid argon from, uh, from noise bursts, where in the first, uh, in the first time we cut uh, rather generous around the noise burst, but uh, this can then be largely recovered uh, in the reprocessing uh, later this year. Okay, triggering in 2012. So uh, the trigger menu is uh, set for a level one rate of uh, 75 uh, kilohertz. And you see here for a, high luminosity, uh, for a high luminosity fill, the level one rate, level two, and event, uh, event filter rate versus time. And you see it is pretty stable where all these jumps here is where we changed uh, pre-scale for, uh, for some calibration or monitoring triggers. Uh, the, uh, most triggers were actually retuned to be uh, robust against pileup. I come to a few examples later. And uh, the average output rate is, uh, is uh, 400 hertz, limited by uh, reconstruction and uh, storage. However, we have now a, uh, an additional rate of uh, 140 hertz, uh, so-called delay triggers, which is mainly B physics or uh, fully hydronics triggers, which will be uh, which will be processed later. And you see here the uh, trigger rate versus uh, versus time. Uh, split it into e gamma uh, jet, uh, jet etimis and um, muons. Okay, minimum bias is hardly visible. And uh, we have here this new delay triggers which were, uh, which were switched on uh, towards, uh, towards the end of May. Okay, uh, a few examples on uh, trigger improvements that we had. Uh, we have uh, some noise cuts on level one on the calorimeter uh, to uh, suppress pileup, which actually lowers the rate uh, dramatically. We could, uh, we could even lower the uh, thresholds on the missing ET trigger because uh, in, uh, last, up to last year, our level two was just a copy of level one, whereas, uh, whereas now we use the, uh, 
uh, we use the sum from the from the front end boards as uh, to calculate missing at t uh, newly at uh, at level two, and you see here the resolution from the old level one and from the uh, new front end board, and you see here in the tail where you want to uh, where you want to put your trigger threshold, you see a dramatic improvement, and in addition we also have a more sophisticated algorithm uh, at the event filter. We retune the tau trigger so that it keeps uh, the rate linear with luminosity and the efficiency is independent of pileup. And you see here the, uh, tau, the different tau triggers trigger rate as a function of the luminosity. And you see that they are very linear. And uh, using isolation, we were able to keep the uh, single lepton threshold. So lepton here means electron or muon pretty low, which is uh, 24 GeV at the moment. Okay, the main theme of this year, of course, is uh, the high pileup. Uh, we are very grateful to the uh, LHC operation team for the superb uh, performance of the machine. However, we pay for this with, uh, with, a, pretty, pre with a pretty high pileup. You see here in the, last, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we have pileup rates in the order of... Um, uh, of 30 or, uh, uh, or above, and we, have, uh, we invested a huge effort over the last months to prepare for these conditions and to minimize the uh, impact on physics. And just to, see what, uh, to show you what it means, this is a Z2 mu mu event from this year with 25 uh, reconstructed uh, vertices, and the fat lines here is to show you where the, uh, where the two muons are. Okay, one important issue is uh, vertexing under, uh, under high pileup. So uh, the vertexing efficiency for the hard scattering process still stays, uh, still stays very high. You see here for different processes, so for, uh, for uh, H2TT, uh, for uh, TT, uh, TT bar, you basically see any pileup dependence, but even for Z2EE, uh, -E, for the maximum pileup, you are still in the order of 99%. Uh, I don't have a plot with me, but the resolution degradation also is, uh, is pretty small. And the PT, spect uh, the PT spectrum of the tracks fitted to the vertices agrees very well with the prediction. This shows uh, the, sum p the sum PT square, which is the uh, variable that we use in most analysis to select, uh, to select the primary vertex for our, uh, for our data from 2012 and for the simulation, and you see that the agreement is extremely good. A few words on tracking performance. So uh, there was a task force working on the uh, pixel on the pixel clustering, and they uh, they came up with a new neural network uh, clustering, which uh, which. Re uh, reduces the resolution quite a bit. So this shows the, the old and the new resolution for uh, three pixel clusters. For four pixel clusters, it's even much more dramatic. Uh, the alignment systematics have been reduced substantially. So this shows the K0 mass as a function of phi. And this is the amplitude we had in 2010. And uh, in 2011, this is essentially flat. And also the efficiency of track extrapolation to the uh, transition radiation tracker stays uh, constant despite the high occupancy that we have now in the TRT with, uh, with high pileup, which, uh, which you can see here. But this is actually something we could train very well because the, have an eye, the heavy iron run is sort of a nice model for high pileup, so uh, one, could, uh, one could learn already uh, during, uh, during the past years. Okay, electrons in 2012. So... Uh, we have improved our electron reconstruction efficiency, so the track and the cluster matching, by a better treatment of uh, Bremsstrahlung losses of the electron in its, way through, uh, in its way through Atlas. You see here the efficiency as a function of eta for Z2EE events. So this is the, uh, this is the new efficiency. This, is the, uh, this was the old efficiency for Z2EE. It's, uh, the improvement is, is even larger for uh, lower energy electrons, like you would have from a Higgs to for uh, to four leptons. The uh, retuning of the cuts also results in an efficiency which is stable against pileup. So you see here for our uh, loose, medium, and tight uh, cuts, the efficiency versus uh, the efficiency versus the number of uh, vertices. And again, this is uh, the level here is even higher than last year, as you have seen here. And also the uh, and also the energy scale is uh, is pretty stable. 
Also for TAUS, the uh, trigger and the reconstruction algorithms have been retuned in 2012 to be more pile-up uh, robust and to keep similar efficiencies as we had at uh, low mu uh, already last, uh, last year. And this was achieved by uh, tighter cones and also by correction based on the number of vertices. And you see here again the signal efficiency on Monte Carlo and the background efficiency on data against the number of vertices. Okay, one of the most difficult quantities under high pileup, of course, is missing ET because uh, the, uh, re the missing ET resolution degrades due to the many additional uh, tracks and the, uh, lots of additional energy you have in the event due to the, uh, due to the pileup events. And you see here with our old algorithm, uh, the uh, missing ET resolution as, the func as a function of some PT for, for no pileup and for very high pileup, and you see a dramatic uh, degradation. However, uh, the new algorithms also use, uh, also use uh, tracking now, because from a track you see if it comes from the primary vertex or if it comes from a secondary vertex, and if you introduce, uh, and if you introduce tracking, you see a pileup uh, you see a, a pileup dependence which is basically zero for a large summit T and still small for a small summit T. Okay, a few words on uh, Atlas computing. So the, t the tier zero is running smoothly, and the increased resources that we got this year allow us to cope with the higher luminosity. You see here that uh, the uh, the, uh, the ti uh, versus time, the number of jobs which are pr currently running and which are waiting in the queue, and you see as soon as uh, as there are uh, as there is a small break, uh, the uh, uh, the queue is uh, is running out uh, very very quickly. So we have no uh, we have no long term backlog. And what is for us very important, we uh, exactly lose zero events uh, for in the data processing, so that uh, all events that we take can then also be used for uh, for physics. Also, uh, tier, the tier one and two are heavily used for uh, Monte Carlo production and user analysis. Again, here you see the, uh, the used wall clock, uh, wall clock uh, time that we get versus time. In red is the user analysis, in blue the Monte Carlo production. And uh, these were the pledges from 2011 and 2012. And you see that at the moment we are able to, uh, well, we got qu uh, quite a bit more than, uh, than that was pledged thanks to the computing centers for this. And uh, this actually allows us uh, to do simulation for, uh, uh, for a much deeper physics program. Okay, uh, pub Atlas publications. So up to today, we have 160 papers published on uh, collision data. So we are publishing at the moment with a, uh, with a frequency of something like two papers, uh, two papers a week. And you see now the searches have overtaken the... Uh, the, uh, the standard model, the standard model measurements, and up to now we have uh, 325 uh, conference notes, of which 60 are from uh, from this year. Okay, so this leads me to a tour through uh, our physics results. So many important results have been uh, presented at the 2012 winter conferences, and consequently reported by uh, Fabio here in uh, in March. However, we have a steady output of uh, new results since uh, then. And, uh, okay, not all results that I show you use the full luminosity because the uh, used luminosity depends clearly on the complexity of, of the analysis, depends uh, on the sensitivity to pile up, but also uh, depends on the need for uh, low PT triggers and things like that. And I will show some uh, selected results from all areas. Since this uh, hard probe conference has, has taken place uh, recently, we released a couple of uh, interesting new, uh, new heavy iron results. So this shows you the Z-production heavy iron with the full luminosity that we got from the heavy iron run last year. So we see Z-production in electron and, uh, and muon channels. So this is uh, the electron-electron invariant mass, the mu-mu invariant mass, where you uh, see beautiful Z-peaks uh, each. And this is just, uh, just to show uh, what we are dealing with, the, uh, an event display of a ZEE event in heavy ions. So in the tracker, you just see lots of tracks, but you see very nice clusters in the, uh, in the calorimeter, which, uh, which, then form a, uh, which then form a Z peak. 
And uh, as, ex as expected for weekly interactions, the bosons are uh, not suppressed as a function of the uh, as a function of the t uh, of the centrality. So you see here the Z rate uh, for. Uh, for low PT, high PT, and uh, and for the sum as a function of the uh, of the number of partons interacting uh, uh, interacting normalized to this number of partons, and you see that the uh, that the curves are uh, are very flat. Okay. The the next thing uh, we looked into is uh, jet quenching. Uh, we have uh, seen jet quenching already uh, in, the very, in, the in the very first events of the, uh, of the 2010 heavy iron run, where you really could see on an event-by-event -event basis a jet on one side and uh, no, jet, uh, no jet on the other side. This has now been confirmed in a more quantitative way with higher statistics and with events really corrected to, uh, corrected to hadron level. And, you, uh, and uh, so this shows as a function of PT for different centrality bins, the, uh, the, uh, the suppression with respect to the peripheral corrections, uh, co collisions, and you see uh, the more central you get, the larger is the suppression, but the P uh, PT dependence is, uh, is extremely small. But then we also looked, in the, uh, looked into the suppression as a function of the, uh, as a function of the jet radius. And uh, as you can expect from the standard picture, if you have a collision somewhere in this hot, dense medium, you, uh, you get a jet to, one si to, the, to the side where, the, uh, where, where you are more or less at the edge. But then when the partons have to travel through the... Uh, have to travel through the medium, they get scattered, they get absorbed, so the jet comes out here much, uh, much wider. So what you actually expect that uh, if you look at wider jets, the suppression gets smaller, and this is what we actually see. So this is the ratio of suppression factors uh, to, uh, for, uh, to narrow jets, is 0.2 jets, which are our standard, but then for 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and you see that the suppression gets smaller, the, uh, the, uh, the wider you get in your, uh, in your jet radius. We also looked into uh, heavy flavor production, heavy ions. So uh, medium energy muons are a good tagger for, uh, heavy, flavor, uh, for heavy flavor jets. And, uh, and then if we look at the, so this is the PT spectrum of the, uh, this is the PT spectrum of the muons for different, uh, for different centrality bins. And then if you look at the, uh, if you look at the suppression with respect to peripheral coll collisions, you see, a pre uh, you see a suppression which is uh, similar to the suppression that you, could s that you can see for uh, all jets. So let me come to one result from uh, B-Physics now. We looked into the lambda B mass and, uh, and uh, lifetime uh, using a constrained fit where the uh, mass of the track pairs has been uh, constrained to the lambda and JSI masses, which actually gives pretty, uh, gives pretty small uh, systematic uncertainty. And also, as a cross-check, the B0 mass and lifetime has been measured with a, similar, uh, with a similar technique. And with this, we get results that are competitive with the world average and for the mass uh, with, uh, with the latest LHCB results. And uh, here, are, uh, here are our results. And you see that for the lifetime, we are even uh, statistically limited at the moment. Okay, uh, some, some standard model results. We measured, for example, the tau polarization in uh, WDK. So this is a measurement of the tau polarization using, uh, using actually not the tau polarization, but the rho polarization. If you, uh, if you take the decay, uh, tau, goes to ga tau goes to rho, uh, rho neut neutrino, the uh, rho polarization actually depends if the tau was left-handed or right-handed, and you can measure the rho polarization by looking at the energy asymmetry of the uh, charged pion and the uh, neutral pion, or in our case of the charged pion and the energy seen in the, uh, seen in the colorimeter. Not surprisingly, the tau is, uh, is left-handed, so this is our result. But the important thing is uh, it has been, uh, this is a proof of principle that the tau polarization measurement actually is possible at Hadron Colliders and that we can hope, hopefully use this, uh, use this later to measure properties of Higgs or supersymmetric particles or whatever we will find. So this shows, uh, this shows the, final the final spectrum. So epsilon is this variable, basically the asymmetry between the uh, charge and the neutral particle. So this is what we measure and agrees very well with the, uh, the uh, left-handed tau. And this is what you would expect for, uh, uh, for a right-handed tau. 
we also entering the, uh, the area of, uh, PD, of PDF fits, where we actually did a measurement of the strange quark density in the proton. So the W and Z distribution actually give you information on the PDF's complementarity to, uh, complementary to ATLAS. If you, if, you, uh, if you neglect the charm, in the, uh, the charm in the proton, which is very small, it's clear that the W is only produced from U and D quarks, while the uh, Z is, only pro is also produced from, uh, from strange quarks. And this is especially in the central region because uh, the Z needs a, a strange from the C and an anti-strange from the C. So you see here our... Uh, you see here our rapidity distribution for the uh, our rapidity distribution for the z and you see here you see here on the ratio for different uh, for different uh, s quark suppressions that we are actually sensitive to this and uh, a common fit of the atlas and the hera data indicates that the uh, that the strange suppression is is small so we measure actually a suppression factor of exactly 1.0 uh, so no suppression but still with uh, with uh, not, not extremely small error bars, but, uh, we, but we already see now a disagreement with the, uh, uh, with the more standard uh, pattern distribution functions, which use uh, neutrino data instead of, uh, instead of uh, LHC data. We also measured uh, TT, bar, uh, TT bar spin correlations. Of course, in uh, strong production, the top is unpolarized, but still the, the spins of the two, of the two tops are, uh, are correlated due to the, uh, due to the production process. And uh, Atlas, uh, the Atlas measurement establishes the spin correlation to uh, 5.1 sigma, where actually 4.2 sigma are, uh, are expected. Okay, this shows you the, uh, this shows you the compatibility of the different uh, of the different channel, and this shows you our sensitive variable, which is the the azimuthal angle difference between the two leptons from the top decay. And uh, the solid curve is what you expect from the standard model with spin correlations, and the dashed. Uh, the dash curve is when you uh, switch off the spin correlation and you see by eye that the data agree much better with the standard model than with, uh, no, uh, with no correlations. Also, we measured the top charge symmetry. So the top charge symmetry, or if, as you, it's more, more often called forward-backward symmetry, at the Tevatron is uh, at the edge of being deviating from the, uh, from the standard model prediction. Uh, of course, uh, in proton-proton, forward and backward are, uh, are equal, so you cannot measure a forward-backward asymmetry in PP. But what you can do is to measure a, uh, a central, a central forward asymmetry. So if usually, usually the, uh, if you do a, pro a TT bar from quark anti-quark, uh, uh, usually the quark comes from a valence quark, while the anti-quark comes from a C. So the quark has a larger momentum than the anti-quark. And now if you, uh, the, uh, the top that is scattered in the CMS frame in the direction of the quark gets a larger boost, so it is uh, boosted towards large rapidity, while the uh, qu uh, while the uh, quark that is uh, or the, uh, while the quark that is scattered in the direction of the anti-quark uh, has lower momentum and so lower boost, so it stays uh, it stays central. So we measure a uh, forward central symmetry, and Atlas has now measured the asymmetry in the two lepton channel with a full. Uh, with a, a full uh, luminosity, and this is the rapidity difference, and you, uh, by I you see, uh, you see no asymmetry. So we measured the asymmetry for two cases, for the, uh, just for the lepton, and then also for the, uh, for the top, uh, with a sophisticated technique to uh, reconstruct the uh, top direction. And for the top asymmetry, we have already a measurement with true femtoband from a one lepton analysis, which we combined. And here are our results, and you see the lepton asymmetry as well as the top asymmetry are in good agreement with the standard model prediction. We measured also uh, single top quark production, and Atlas sees evidence for the so-called uh, WT channel, where you produce by, by these two diagrams, a w, uh, the to, uh, single top quark uh, together with a W in the uh, in the final state, and uh, as you as you see from the as you see from the vertices here, this. Uh, uh, this measurement is uh, sensitive to VTB, so the 3.3 sigma measurement that we do then translates into a VTB measurement, which is consistent with one with an error of uh, plus 0.16 minus 0.19. Also, the standard uh, the standard T channel has been measured. Uh, the uh, the 
the total cross-section has been shown already, but now we have done this measurement separately for, uh, for the top and the anti-top and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and calculated the ratio in which, of, uh, of course, the systematic errors largely uh, cancel. So the individual channels agree with the standard model, but, and the ratio starts to be sensitive to the uh, U, over D, uh, U over D ratio. So this is... Uh, this is the ratio that we that we uh, that we measure with the with the errors, and these are the current uh, these are the current PDF sets. So we cannot ex exclude yet uh, anything, but uh, with smaller error bars, this is also starting to get uh, to get sensitive. Let me come now to uh, searches and start with uh, supersymmetry. So. Uh, so this, this are, uh, this are the, super, the SUSY cross-section for different particles, where here you are the uh, strongly interacting particles, and here are the weakly interacting particles as a function of a mass. And of course, as a function of the mass, all cross-sections fall, uh, fall strongly. So if you have larger luminosity, you get more sensitive, so you can, uh, so you can look for uh, higher masses. So this is a sort of standard direction, but you can also look for uh, rarer processes. So for the stand so more standard scenarios like minimal sugra and so where you are where you are sensitive to these uh, strongly interacting particles we cover now uh, mass regions of larger than one point, uh, larger than one TeV. So this is the standard M0, M1 half plane for uh, our zero lepton, one lepton, and two lepton analysis. And you see we are here at, uh, for the Gluino, we are now at something like uh, 1.4 TeV, and, at, uh, and we are at around 800, uh, ME, 800 GeV for the squawks. However, as I said, we can also go this direction and, uh, and look for rarer processes. Uh, for uh, covering scenarios with a larger mass splitting, so where this part is just uh, shifted out of the plane and you are left with the, uh, you are left with the weakly interacting particles, for example. So we looked for uh, charginos and uh, neutralinos. So uh, the direct chargino neutralino production has a cross-section in the Picoban range, and we have searched in this, uh, for these particles using the, uh, the three-lepton uh, final states, and limits in the order of 150 GeV have been set. So this is uh, this is the plane uh, mu versus uh, mu versus m2, and in blue is uh, what you uh, is what is excluded by Atlas. And this is, for example, 150 uh, 150 uh, GeV Chargino, which is uh, which is completely excluded. We also looked for. Uh, Look for third generation squawks. These squawks are, are, are interesting for two reasons. First of all, if you want to use SUSY to solve the hierarchy problem, you need, you need basically light third generation squawks because the third generation is the, is the one that is responsible for the, uh, for the hierarchy problem. But also the, uh, the left right mixing depends not on the mass of the particles, but on the mass of the particles. So you expect a su substantial uh, left right mixing only in the third generation and this can make the third generation pretty, pretty light. So we have looked for uh, very light stops in direct production using two leptons and missing ET, and we have looked for stops and, and bottoms in uh, gluino-mediated production, so where, you, uh, where first the gluino is produced but then decays into the stop or the, uh, or the spotum in events with uh, more, than three, uh, more or equal to three uh, B jets and missing ET. We see no signal, so we, uh, so we set limits. And this is, these are the stop limits, which are depending on the neutralino mass in the 150 to, some, to something like 100 GeV region. And this, are, uh, and this is for the, uh, the gl uh, gluino-mediated production, the spotum the spotum limit, and here we come for gluinos also in the, uh, in the TEV region, and the spotum, okay, must be lighter than the gluino per, uh, per definition. Okay, before I come to uh, exotics, let me come back to standard model for a moment, because uh, properties of boosted jet, if you are looking for a very high mass new particles, resonances, which then decay into immediate states like uh, top quarks or, uh, double, or gauge bosons, and these intermediate states again decay hadronically. Uh, if the mass is very high, these intermediate particles are very boosted, so the decay products get actually, uh, get actually merged into one fat jet and are no longer uh, resolvable. So you need very special reconstruction algorithms for these kind of uh, 
for this kind of events. And it must be shown that uh, standard QCD jets are understood in this regime that you are able to understand your background. And, uh, and also these measurements are then provide, if they don't, do not agree directly, uh, provide information for further Monte Carlo tuning. And the upper plot shows you the jet mass uh, shows you the jet mass for high PT fat jets in a standard QCD sample, and you see that most Monte Carlo programs actually uh, describe this rather nicely. And the lower plot shows you the background subtracted jet mass in the search for TT bar resonances, and you see a nice peak at the top mass in this to uh, in this sort of uh, in this sort of events. So now coming to the searches directly, so we, lo uh, we looked for TB bar and uh, TT bar resonances. And actually for the TT bar, we have done the normal search with the resolved, uh, with the resolved tops, but also we have done the search with the, uh, with the boosted uh, techniques. And uh, already now the boosted techniques are uh, more sensitive, especially as the high mass. However, the uh, normal or resolved techniques still contribute at, uh, at low masses. So this shows you the reconstructed uh, TT bar mass in the boosted analysis, and you see that we uh, that we see events up to up to around uh, up to around 3 TeV, and this is a possible signal at. Uh, at 1.3 TeV, and again we see nothing, so we set limits. And the upper plot shows you the uh, TT shows you the TT bar analysis interpreted in uh, in Kalusa uh, Klein gluon resonances. And here we have a limit in the order of uh, 1.5 TeV. And the lower plot is the uh, TB bar analysis interpreted as uh, uh, W prime. And here the limit is in the order of 1.1 uh, TeV. Okay, I don't have very much to say at the standard, for the standard model, about the standard model Higgs today. The 2011 analysis are, uh, are now published or will be published within the next uh, one or two weeks. And uh, we have some improvement in the different uh, channels and in the combination. This shows you the limit plots that, uh, that have been published in the last, uh, in the last couple, of, uh, couple of days. However, the general picture doesn't, uh, doesn't change. But we have also looked for uh, Higgs's in some exotic scenarios. So, for example, a, a search for a charged Higgs. Supersymmetry predicts that a charged Higgs must exist, and this charged Higgs must have a mass larger than the uh, W mass. Atlas has, uh, has searched for it in, t uh, in top decay, so TT bar goes to uh, charged Higgs B, W, B, and the charged Higgs decays into uh, a tau and a neutrino. And uh, so the, uh, this, this shows uh, tr the transverse mass that can be reconstructed for such, for such events for the, for, the data, for the data, for a predicted background, which agree, uh, which agree very well, and uh, for, a possible, uh, for a possible signal. And not finding a signal allows us to set exclusions, for example, in MSSM in the uh, charged Higgs mass uh, tangent beta plane, and you see that a very large part of the allowed region for the case where the charge Higgs is lighter than the uh, is lighter than the top, actually could be uh, could be excluded. Okay, this leads me to my summary. So, of course, we are very grateful to the uh, LHC operation team for the outstanding performance of the machine in the first month of uh, this year. Atlas is using this luminosity very efficiently, so we have a data taking efficiency of 95 percent and 90 percent. Uh, 90% of the data can be, uh, can be used for analysis, and this even can be uh, increased in the reprocessing. After a lot of work, the effects of uh, pileup are under control and finally are uh, small, and uh, many results on the full 2011 data set of 5 femtobahn have been released, and the foundations for an uh, exciting and broad physics program based on the 2012 data have been laid. Thank you, Klaus, for a very comprehensive talk. <clears throat> well, this was a tour de force to everything. So, uh, questions? Let me start light and easy. Uh, in the beginning, you showed um, the noise suppression, how it helped you on the pileup correction. Could you show that again? I didn't quite understand the oh, argument. Which one you mean? In the very beginning, when you said that. Uh, with better, better noise studies, you had a handle on, on the pileup. Uh, I just didn't understand the argument in the very beginning. So, 
Oh, this matrix. Give me an idea. Earlier, Sorry? before, then you, I think you're former, going forward. Yeah. Uh, how do the noise cuts help you suppress yeah. the pileup? Yeah, noise uh, pileup uh, pile is pileup is pileup is. Uh, a pileup is the noise. Okay. Pileup is the noise. It's just something okay. that is everywhere, right? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I thought you had uh, electronic noise or something. No, no. Uh, um, okay. Good. I asked. Further questions? Yes, please. Maybe uh, you show that, that you have under control the high pile up for uh, vertexine, vertexine charge tracks. I was wondering if what is the effect of high pile up when you try to reconstruct two photons uh, to identify the right uh, vertex for these two photons, if there is any effect? For the Higgs or gamma gamma, of course. Okay, we don't have released results on, uh, on photons yet, but. Pileup can also there. We, can, we also can get pileup under control. Uh, under control there. You have seen that we that we understand that we, that we understand the uh, the pileup in the vertices uh, in the vertices pretty well. So we can deal with this. Yes, Fabian. Please. Perhaps I can add to what Klaus said that uh, for in, this, in the special case of X to gamma gamma, actually we are not really affected by pileup because there we have a calorimeter that has a longitudinal segmentation, so we can use the direction of the photons to reconstruct the primary vertex. Actually, we do several things. We use the pointing of the calorimeter. We use the converted uh, converted photons. We use also the vertex using this method, and we combine all of them with the likelihood. So really. X to gamma gamma is a relatively easy case for us. But let me still try and summarize the, 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 the impression on the pineup situation. It's not so that you, uh, I think you still favor 24, 25 nanoseconds over 50 nanoseconds. And I think the argument is that in, in a very busy environment, uh, you will have difficulties associating the neutrals, right? Yeah, and we, okay, we, finally, we want to factor two more luminosity, and, uh, the pilot, and the minimum bias cross section at 14 TeV is higher than at, uh, than at 8 TeV. So, uh, so this means uh, there are two directions why it would get even worse if we run with, uh, if we continue like this with, one, with 10 to the 34 and, uh, and 14 TeV. So uh, clearly, we, want, uh, we, pr we still prefer low pileup. Sure. Further question, yes, please, Marcel. Yeah, you showed this very interesting improvement of the missing ED resolution using the tracking. Mm. To what extent do you still use the calorimeters to make that improvement, and especially the hadronic calorimeters? We still, we still calculate the missing ET with the, uh, with the calorimeters. We use, uh, we use the tracking to get a jet vertex fraction, so to get the sort of for every jet, for every jet, you get a measure which part of this jet is coming from uh, is coming from pileup, and which which fraction is coming from uh, is coming from uh, the primary vertex from the hard scatter. But uh, the main the main measurement is still done using the calorimeters. But but not in the trigger, right? Sorry. But but not in the met in the trigger. Not that's, in the trigger. No no not in the trigger. So I think he was asking the trigger, right or no? I was not asking for the trigger because I don't think you can. It would be very nice if you could implement it in the trigger, but I don't think you can. <laughs> no, no. Uh, for the, uh, for this, for uh, for, the, uh, for so this is this is uh, this is the offline, and there we use there we use mainly this uh, jet vertex fraction techniques, which actually give you on a jet by jet basis the fraction uh, the fraction of this jet energy which is coming from a minimum bias event, or and the uh, the fraction from uh, from the main uh, from the main vertex. Yes, Jürgen. Yes, please. Mm. Uh, so where we have charged tracks, of course, you, you can somehow fight the pileup. But what about the gamma gamma channel? Yeah, we just had we uh, just had this discussion. We have the nice calorimeter pointing. But, we don't. We are not but, so. But do you have a, a plot where you see the resolution as a function of the number of pileup vertices, or no, not yet. Okay. It's flat, but we, we don't. We know that the impact of pileup on X to gamma gamma is really, really small, marginal. So we are really dominated still by the uh, energy resolution of the calorie and the intrinsic resolution of the calorie. 
maybe one more question, if I may, on, on the booster jet analysis. Mm. Um, that's actually very nice when, when you see the uh, top resolve there. How far can you actually carry that? Would you also resolve B jets? No, or that's too far? You mean a recognized B jets? In the, using the, the boosted uh, uh, jet analysis to, to really distinguish B jets from light jets? I, okay, these techniques have been used at lab from, to use event I shapes. I mm. think we have n uh, not yet really tried to do this at the LH, to do this at the LHC. Okay, we have seen from lab that there is some sensitivity, but even at lab, the sensitivity was uh, was pretty was pretty small. So I don't expect that this is extremely useful at oh, the LHC. It's, it's clearly pushing it, but um, since you have this technique now at hand. Okay. But now, but, uh, but uh, I have shown you jet masses of 100 GeV, and uh, <laughs> now you, you ask about jet masses of 5 yes. GeV, so. <laughs> I am aware of that, yes. Okay, no further questions.